Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see so many people here this evening for what is a very important conversation and hopefully a catalyst for future discussions and concrete actions. I'm Diana Marmer, an associate at Sullivan and Cromwell and a member of the Human Rights Committee at the City Bar. The committee put together this program in order to engage with leading experts on many of the fundamental international and human rights issues implicated by the refugee crises and to address some of the critical questions that have arisen. What human rights are at stake? What obligations does the international community have, if any? What efforts are underway in the United States and in Europe? How effective has the response been? But tonight is just the beginning of the conversation, as we will also consider what we, both as a community and as individual legal practitioners and human rights advocates, can concretely do to engage meaningfully in these issues. To extend the dialogue beyond the four corners of this room, we encourage all of you to use our hashtag, NYC Bar Refugees, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Today's program is being taped, so others will have the opportunity to join the conversation at a later date using this hashtag. Again, that's NYC Bar Refugees. Our moderator this evening is Mary Ellen Fullerton. Mary Ellen is a law professor at Brooklyn Law School, an expert in asylum and refugee law, and a valued member of the Human Rights Committee. She has received numerous accolades and published more articles than I have time to name. Two of them are in your packet of CLE materials. Mary Ellen will be introducing you to our panelists who will offer insights into the crises from their unique vantage points. This will be followed by a Q&A session and then a wine and cheese reception where you can speak with representatives from legal service organizations about opportunities that you can get involved. Again, I would like to thank all of you for coming this evening. I would also like to thank the City Bar for their generous support for this event, as well as members of the Human Rights Committee for their help putting together this program. And with that, I will turn it over to Mary Ellen. Thank you, Diana. Um, I want to extend my welcome to all of you in the audience and to the, the speakers on the panel uh, for coming out on this rainy Wednesday evening. Uh, it's rainy and wet here, but we're sitting in safety. And we're here to talk about thousands of people who have been fleeing violence and death and seeking refuge in Europe and the United States in the last year. Uh, we've been watching newsreels of hundreds of thousands of people literally walking across borders to find safety. We've read numerous reports of millions of people who've been displaced from their home and their countries. UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, estimates that there are 15 million refugees in the world today, 35 million internally displaced persons, and other people who are in desperate need of protection. Thinking about Syria alone, Syria has a population of approximately 23 million people. There are 7 million people displaced within Syria. There are four million Syrians who have fled the country. Uh, there are more who haven't been forced from their homes who are starving. Uh, most of the refugees from Syria are in neighboring countries, but we know that a million refugees and migrants came to Europe in the last 12 months. 942,000 of them claimed asylum according to the statistics uh, that the European Union put together. We've seen debates in the United States about Syrian refugees also, uh, although we have shamefully small numbers. We've also seen in the wake of horrifying violence in Central America and in parts of Mexico, rising numbers of unaccompanied minors and families seeking refuge at the southern border of the United States. 
in fiscal year 2013, there were 38,000 unaccompanied children at the southern border of the United States who are registered. In 14, that number went up to 68,000. Last year, fiscal year 2015, it fell back to 20,000. But in the first quarter of the fiscal year of 2016, so the last three months, there were 20,000 unaccompanied children registered at the southern border of the United States. That's twice as many as in the same quarter last year. And all this at the time when the apprehensions at the southern border of the United States are the lowest since the 1970s. What we're seeing here are new phenomena and old problems uh, and maybe paradigm shifts. Both in Europe and the United States, we're seeing people crossing borders and not trying to elude border guards. In fact, they're running up to the border guards and seeking asylum, asking for safety. We're also seeing a very dis different uh, a new use of technology. Uh, we see refugees using their smartphones, just like ours, uh, and using GPS to figure out how to get to the next place where they might be able to lay their head. Um, but the powerful news photos and the YouTube videos, as compelling as they are, do not tell us much about the law that applies to refugees. And the law that is reported is usually garbled, or at least incomplete. So that's what our focus is tonight. It's on the law and on opportunities for lawyers and law students to provide legal assistance to refugees. We're going to look specifically at our human rights obligations and how they apply to these humanitarian crises that we are witnessing. Uh, there are numerous human rights treaties that we should be aware of. I will just name uh, the tip of the iceberg, starting with the 1951 Refugee Convention and its 1967 Protocol. Also the Convention Against Torture. Also the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In Europe, there's the European Convention on Human Rights with a very expansive view on uh, protection against inhuman and degrading treatment. In the Americas, there's the American Declaration on the, there's American Convention on Human Rights, to which the U.S. is not a party, and there's the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. There's the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and there are others. Um, we're not going to talk about them all tonight, but we're going to try to sketch out both the legal framework and how it's actually being applied and not applied in today's refugee situations. Our very first speaker, uh, Jesse Tampio from the State Department, uh, has agreed to help spell out some of the framework on some of the basic concepts and some of the basic definitions under refugee law and human rights law. He'll give us the State Department's perspective on U.S. human rights obligations in this arena. He's also going to talk to us about some of the work that the State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migrants does, both internationally and in resettlement of refugees in the United States. And I think Jesse's a perfect person to talk to us because of his background. His biography's in the materials, and I'm not going to repeat it other than to, to say that he's at the State Department in the Office of Legal Advisor and particularly in the Office of Human Rights and Refugees. Um, but he comes to government service with a real commitment and a mentorship for other law students and young lawyers who are interested in government service. Um, and uh, I think we're all here tonight talking about both legal obligations and what we as lawyers can do, and that's a, a great stance to start with. So I turn the podium over to Jesse. Hi. Um, thank you all for coming. This is a great uh, audience, a great room, and a really uh, distinguished panel. Um, I've only been doing this work for um, less than three years. Uh, I'm honored to do it. It's important work, um, interesting work, but that's much less than the other uh, panelists, so I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from them as well. Um, so as uh, Mary Ellen said, I'm going to start with some of the key legal issues and then um, 
talk a little bit about what my client bureau, um, as attorneys in our office, we're all kind of attached to one of the various policy bureaus in the State Department, and I work closely with the uh, PRM, the Population, Refugees, and Migration Bureau. So I'll tell you a little bit about what they do on behalf of refugees around the world. So um, what the U.S. is a party to the 1967 uh, refugee protocol, as well as several of the human rights treaties that um, Mary Ellen mentioned. Um, and we take our obligations under those treaties very seriously. We implement them in various ways domestically, and we uh, urge other countries around the world to do the same. Um, so to go through them a little bit, the, the refugee protocol takes a little bit of context. There was a 1951 refugee convention um, that was really you know, negotiated in the aftermath of World War II with the refugee crises in Europe at that time. So uh, the U.S. participated in the negotiation of that, but we did not ratify it. And the terms of that convention are limited to uh, refugees that arose um, prior to 1951 and largely out of Europe. Um, but the 1967 protocol was negotiated in recognition that this really was a uh, broader and a continuing uh, problem, the refugee problem. So basically the refugee protocol incorporates the substance of the 51 convention and just strips out the geographic and temporal restrictions um, so it's a freestanding instrument, and that's why the U.S. ratified that, but we're not a party to the original convention. Um, but to be honest, even though we uh, uh, ratified it in about 68 or so, we didn't really truly implement our own obligations uh, until the 1980 Refugee Act, uh, which really created uh, the modern U.S. asylum system and created our refugee admissions program, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but I'm just going to, you'll hear me just refer to the convention. I'm sure a lot of the other panelists will do that as well, just because of the way that two instruments are intertwined. So Article 1 of the convention uh, lays out the uh, definition of a refugee, which is essentially a person um, outside of his uh, or her country of origin who's unwilling to return to that country due to a well-founded fear, as our uh, panel is called, of um, being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion. There are exceptions to refugee status, largely on criminal or national security grounds. It's noteworthy that the word persecution is not defined, um, so it could cover a very broad range of conduct. Um, and the U.S. has essentially incorporated this definition into our own uh, Immigration and Nationality Act. The keystone of the Refugee Convention is Article 33, um, which contains the non refuma obligation. And what that means is that a state cannot send a refugee back to their um, country of origin if they face a threat to life or liberty on one of those same five protected grounds. Um, and under U.S. law, a refugee has to show, or an individual has to show that it's more likely than not that they'd face that kind of persecution to get um, the relevant types of protection. Um, the other convention articles cover the rights that refugees have um, once they've been recognized and what, you know, they, how, based on that status. And it uh, covers things like employment, education, um, social security, and freedom of movement and so on. Um, and the U.S. implements our obligations under this treaty um, largely through the U.S. asylum process and other kinds of protections you can get if you're in an immigration uh, removal proceeding. So essentially, uh, a foreign national can walk off the street and go to a DHS asylum office and request asylum. Or if a foreign national is in a removal proceeding um, in front of an immigration judge, they can request asylum or other forms of protection uh, as a defense against removal. The other major um, international non refuma obligation that the U.S. has is um, Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture. And the Convention Against Torture, or CAT, was done in 1984. Um, the U.S. ratified it a decade later. And it um, augmented the existing uh, prohibition on torture under international law with several mechanisms to bolster that. And one of those is Article 3, which is the, um, prevents a country from um, expelling, returning, or extraditing an individual um, if there's a risk of torture. And essentially, under U.S. law, it's the same, more likely than not, um, standard. Um, interesting thing about CAT is that there's no uh, requirement for it to be because of race or nationality or any of those standards. It's, it can just be a risk of torture. Um, that, uh, you know, there's no exception for criminal or national security grounds, so even uh, terrorists. Um, you know, can benefit from cat protection, as it's called. Um, and, but you're not recognized as a refugee in the same way. Um, so if you claim cat protection in the U.S., you can be protected from being sent back to that country where you'd face torture, but um, and you usually can stay here and work, but you're not really a refugee in the same sense. Um, 
we're party to several of the human rights treaties that Mary Ellen mentioned, including the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the CERD, which is the Race Discrimination Treaty, and the CAT. Um, and really, we can get into the, more of that later. I'll just say that in general, those uh, apply to refugees on U.S. soil the same way they do any other um, individual. And they cover rights such as freedom of movement, freedom of speech, religion, uh, freedom from torture or cruel uh, and unusual treatment, prohibition on racial discrimination, and so on. Um, I should mention also the 1948 Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is not a binding instrument, but really sets the foundation for the whole uh, human rights movement. And Article 14 of that instrument uh, recognizes the right um, to seek and enjoy asylum. And what's interesting there is that there's no right to receive asylum, but uh, you know, consistent with uh, the UDHR, we do urge countries to at least allow individuals to seek and you know, request asylum and then honor it once it's been granted. Um, as Mary Ellen alluded to, you know, the U.S. has certain of these obligations that I've covered, but other countries can have different um, obligations in this field. And um, there's 148 countries that are party to the Refugee Convention and or protocol, but there are several important countries that are not, um, especially in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, to name just a few, the Gulf states, Jordan, which is a host to 600,000 Syrian refugees, um, India and Indonesia. And uh, some of these may be party to the Convention Against Torture. Some of them may allow the um, UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, to operate in certain capacities. But um, they will all disclaim any obligations towards recognizing individuals as refugees. Uh, but we still, um, in our diplomacy, uh, urge these countries to uphold uh, the principle of non refoulement And we will uh, criticize countries specifically on their treatment of refugees in our annual country reports on human rights practices, which are available on the web for anybody to, to read. At the same time, other countries may have greater obligations in the U.S. Um, Europe is a great example. Um, as Mary Ellen mentioned, there's the European Convention on Human Rights, which has been interpreted to have an implied non refoulement obligation um, to not send individuals back if they would face a real risk of uh, torture or um, inhumane treatment or other, I think, other human rights uh, violations. Um, and that court's also interpreted the U European Convention to apply to a state's actions outside of its borders, um, whereas the U.S., um, the, the Supreme Court has interpreted the refugee protocol to only apply on U.S. soil in the um, sale decision, which is fairly controversial, I'm sure, among uh, my uh, colleagues on the panel. Um, in Europe, you also have the Dublin system, uh, which you probably have heard about, that essentially allows a country like Germany, if a, a refugee shows up and they entered Europe through Italy, that um, Germany can send that individual back to Italy to have their asylum claim processed there. Um, it's never been a fully uh, functional system, and it's under enormous strain right now. But uh, it is important to understand these because you can't always compare apples to orange or apples to apples. Really, you, know, you can't compare a European situation with the U.S. Um, you really have to understand the legal context that they're making certain decisions and uh, taking certain actions uh, within. Um, there are some important uh, regional refugee instruments. There's a 1969 uh, African Union um, Refugee Convention, and there's a 1984 non-binding uh, Cartagena Declaration that applies in. Latin America, um, and both of these are notable mostly because they broaden the definition to include essentially individuals uh, fleeing uh, various forms of generalized violence. Um, and one other last legal point I'll mention is um, especially, uh, you know, it's in the news a lot, or uh, at least, you know, in legal discussions, is this concept of secondary movement. And that refers to a situation where, say, a, a Syrian refugee has fled into Turkey and they're safe in Turkey from being returned to Syria. Maybe they can't work or not getting a good education. Um, and then they move from there to Europe. And the question is whether at that point they should still maintain a refugee status or whether they're really at that point acting more like an economic migrant, you know, searching for a better standard of living. And uh, at this point, the answer has largely been yes. Um, you know, they maintain that refugee status. In the U.S., it's a very high bar, you have to be firmly resettled in another country uh, with essentially you know, citizenship or, or almost citizenship for us to disqualify you from refugee status. But um, there's other rules in Europe, and I think that that issue is going to become more important and more uh, difficult as time goes on with the numbers that we're seeing. 
So with that, I'm going to pivot now to discuss a little bit about uh, what the State Department's doing in this area on behalf of refugees. I'm going to start just by reading the PRM mission statement, which I think is uh, uh, really, you know, encapsulates it pretty well. The mission of the uh, Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration is to provide protection, ease suffering, and resolve the plight of persecuted and uprooted people around the world on behalf of the American people by providing life-sustaining assistance, working through multilateral systems to build global partnerships, promoting best practices in humanitarian response, and ensuring that humanitarian principles are thoroughly integrated into U.S. foreign and national security policy. So what does that concretely mean? Um, well, one of the major things that PRM does is uh, responding to humanitarian crises and emergencies by working with and funding a lot of the um, top UN and other international organizations. Uh, PRM is a conduit uh, through which the U.S. provides uh, significant funding to the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, the um, International Committee of the Red Cross, International Organization for Migration, and others. Um, PRM also funnels a lot of money to non uh, governmental organizations in the field. PRM engages in humanitarian diplomacy, uh, both bilaterally with uh, individual countries and in multilateral settings to address um, and resolve humanitarian crises around the world. This could include persuading governments, um, hosting refugees to keep their borders open, um, and to uh, you know, convincing countries to support and respect the rights of populations of concern. Um, the goal with refugees, um, there's really, people talk about three durable solutions um, that are really the goal to resolve a refugee situation. Those are voluntary repatriation, essentially people deciding on their own to go home, uh, local integration, um, which is another word for kind of getting asylum or being allowed to stay, and resettlement um, into a third country. Um, I should mention that when we talk about populations of concern, uh, those include not only refugees, but um, other kinds of conflict victims, stateless persons, internally displaced persons. And uh, internally displaced is really um, sometimes can get lost in the um, dialogue because when we talk about 60 million um, displaced people worldwide, uh, over half, 38 million of those are internally displaced and they're not refugees and there's no international convention on international uh, inter internally displaced persons outside of Africa. Um, and they can raise issues that are quite different, but at the very least, we say that countries need to respect um, th those individuals' human rights. One other thing I'll say about um, PRM, they focus a lot on women and children and their needs, especially in an emergency situations. Uh, they started a program called Safe from the Start uh, in 2013 uh, to ensure that um, these needs are taken into account from the outset of an emergency. So one good example is making sure that a refugee camp uh, from the outset has proper lighting to reduce the risk of um, sexual violence. Um, the last point is that, um, as we've touched on a little bit, the PRM administers the U.S. Uh, refugee admissions program, which is how the U.S. admits and resettles uh, particularly vulnerable refugees uh, currently living overseas. So just to draw the distinction, asylum is what you request when you're already on U.S. soil, and the refugee admissions program is how we bring refugees who are currently living overseas and resettlement, resettle them into the U.S. Uh, we, the U.S. resettles more uh, refugees than all other countries combined. That doesn't necessarily mean we grant more asylum. You know, you see Germany's uh, granting, or I don't know, they have a million asylum seekers. I don't know what, how many they've granted, but um, again, you don't want to compare apples and oranges there. But we do resettle more than any other country combined. Um, last several years, it's been 70,000. Uh, this year, we're going for 85, and next fiscal year, the goal is 100,000. It's a remarkable program that involves partnerships with UNHCR, uh, the I International Organization for Migration, nonprofit partners, other agencies like Homeland Security and HHS, <clears throat> and uh, a huge network of nonprofit agencies. Um, most refugees who are resettled get jobs, they enroll their children in schools, pay taxes, um, and after five years, uh, many choose to become naturalized citizens. So it's a program we're very proud of. It's been in the news a lot lately, as you've probably heard, with various state governors trying to block Syrian refugees from coming to their state. Um, I hope no one misinterprets our hashtag as, as that NYC is trying to bar refugees from coming here. But uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully people won't, won't get that misimpression. But anyway, it's, um, it's led to a lot of litigation. There's been uh, or, already three court cases that are going on that are litigating. Uh, we're participating in those. We're, we're going to defend the program, and we're confident it will continue. So that's a quick overview, and I'm uh, looking forward to the uh, other panelists and a great Q&A. Thanks.
thank you, Jesse, for that overview and also for sticking to the 15-minute time. Uh, we have so many panelists who know so much, they could each speak for an hour and 15 minutes, but they've agreed to try to, to focus their remarks on just a small portion of what they, what they know and, uh, and to keep it to 15 minutes. And our second panelist tonight is my good friend and colleague, Alex Alenikoff. Alex has uh, recently completed five years as the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees of the UN agency that is responsible for refugees. Before that, he was the dean at Georgetown Law School. Uh, before that, he was in the, the, the United States uh, government in um, the forerunner to DHS. Uh, he was part of professor, uh, President Obama, pr Professor Obama. Uh, that's the academic for me. Uh, 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 the uh, administration's transition team on uh, immigration-related uh, matters. He brings um, so many different perspectives, so much experience um, that we are delighted to have him here, and we've asked him to uh, particularly touch on uh, the global perspective since he's seen that uh, in the last five years in a very intense daily way. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Um, it's really great that the uh, International Human Rights Committee could sponsor this event and to see a full room on this issue is just fabulous. I was thinking that I'm actually a um, fourth generation New York lawyer. My father, grandfather, and great grandfather are all New York lawyers. I assume they belong to this esteemed institution. Uh, and the first was a refugee. He fled uh, uh, Ukraine for um, religious reasons uh, and came here. He was also a socialist, and I don't think I've ever said that in public before, <laughs> but I think you're now allowed to actually say that again in the United States. Anyway, um, I'd also like to say just to start on, about the Refugee Convention, uh, the, the United States was uh, incredibly well represented uh, at the, uh, uh, the drafting of the convention because we had one, uh, Lewis Henkin there, uh, uh, who was representing uh, refugees. Um, uh, we lost Lou a few years ago, but Alice Henkin is here with us tonight in the audience. I want to recognize her. So, so um, I'm not going to talk much law. I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the international system. I'll try to do that uh, briefly. Uh, I do want to start by saying, uh, unlike other uh, international human rights conventions, there's no treaty body. There's no international refugee court. Uh, the convention establishes a set of norms, but they're, they're all enforced domestically through domestic law, and occasionally the European Court of Human Rights will get involved as a human rights issue, but there's no, there's no uh, supranational organization uh, charged with enforcing immigration law, and that leads to differing interpretations around the world um, uh, in, in different courts as to what exactly the convention uh, means. It also leads to a fair amount of uh, borrowing back and forth with uh, less so in the United States, but more so in, in other jurisdictions, reading the decisions of other courts and, and uh, creating really sort of a transnational dialogue on the meaning of the convention. But that all happens informally through networks of judges, uh, not through any kind of uh, uh, hierarchical system. Uh, the way the system works in practice on the international level um, is really through the function of uh, UNHCR. Uh, UNHCR was created a year before the convention was drafted. So people think of it as a treaty body. It's not. It was statute uh, in the General Assembly in 1950 uh, created the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees. And when it began, it was just a bunch of lawyers like you guys. I mean, basically the function of the office uh, was to make sure people had documentation that then gave them rights as refugees because Europe was facing still a crisis of uh, many millions of uh, uh, refugees with uncertain uh, status. Its role has grown over time, and I'll say a bit more about that. But in the statute that created UNHCR, it says UNHCR's job is to provide protection and not in, just in a physical sense of protection, but in a sense of guaranteeing people's rights and status, and also to seek solutions. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. Um, we, we tend to think of the, the way the refugee flows work around the world is that people flee across borders because of violence, uh, they get emergency care, they all live in tents, uh, in camps, and then after a few months or maybe a year or so, they go home. 
And virtually none of that is accurate except that lots of people uh, have been fleeing. Um, and UNHCR does provide emergency support in those first few months. Um, uh, probably only about a quarter to a third of all refugees live in camps. Uh, among the four million Syrian refugees, and there are one million in Lebanon, none of them live in refugee camps. Jordan has two camps which house about 15% of the refugees. Uh, and in Turkey, more, many more than half of the refugees of the 2.5 million refugees in Turkey do not live in camps. So although we tend to focus iconically on the tent and the camp, it's not where most refugees live. They live in rural settlements or in urban um, settings. Um, the funding for UNHCR, and I mentioned this because PM, uh, PRM is sitting here, uh, comes uh, through voluntary donations. That means it's not part of the assessed contributions given to the United Nations. Every year, UNHCR goes out and has to raise now $3 billion a year. Um, it does that generally from about 18 to 20 uh, uh, countries around the world. The United States is by far the largest contributor. Fun uh, of uh, giving anywhere between 30 to almost 40 percent of the operating budget uh, of UNHCR, and that's administered by, by PRM, by, the, uh, by Jesse's branch there. Now, the way this is all supposed to work, um, the deal between the refugee hosting states and the rest of the world is supposed to be uh, through international solidarity is the phrase that's used. Um, and the way that has generally worked is that neighboring states, states neighboring a country in crisis, have let people come over the border and be settled there uh, for some period of time. And the developed states, far from the crisis, are the ones who are supposed to pay up. And the thinking on that is that the, 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 the asylum, country of first asylum says, hey, these aren't our citizens. We have this flow of refugees simply because we happen to be next to a country that's fallen apart. But this must be a burden that is shared around the world if we have a real, true functioning system on, uh, on refugees. And in fact, 80 to 85% of the world's refugees are in developing states. And 80 to 85% of the money to take that's given through the UNHCR and other multilateral organizations and NGOs comes from developed states. So that's, that's kind of the, the deal, if you will, that, that goes on. The way the system is supposed to function is that refugees are supposed to be given access to countries of first asylum. They're supposed to be guaranteed rights in that country based on the convention or the domestic law of the state. And there's supposed to be solutions for them, meaning that they are supposed to be able to either go home safely, sorry, uh, they're either supposed to be able to go home safely, uh, or they're able to resettle elsewhere, or they're able to uh, integrate in, uh, into the country which has given them asylum. This is not functioning very well at the moment, and I'm really, um, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to say the system is largely broken. Uh, the international refugee regime is largely broken. There is fairly good emergency care when people flood across borders. The international community rallies, planes fly supplies in, UNHCR is there with its partners, tents are put up uh, originally. Uh, but many of these emergencies go on and on and on and on, or they just become normalized and people stay refugees uh, for a very long time. I'll say a bit more about that. So on, on the access side, generally countries have left their borders open. But even there, we see now a closing of borders. I think Bill will talk more about what's happening in the Middle East, in Jordan, and Lebanon, and Turkey. But because the numbers came in, and they didn't go beyond those countries until very recently, those countries finally said, enough is enough. And they've begun to tighten their borders. I think you're well aware of what's happened uh, for many years of interdiction of Haitians and others uh, trying to come to the United States, denied access, and of uh, the uh, policies that Australia has put in place. There are other deterrent policies uh, in Asia as well. Um, so that's on the access side. Uh, even more troubling is on the rights side. Under the convention, the convention was adopted at a time in 1951 of human rights conventions. It should be seen as a major human rights convention with a long list of, of important human rights, um, most of which uh, are, are abridged routinely around the world. The rights include the right to labor. Most states deny refugees the right to work. The right to travel freely. A number of states have encampment policies that require refugees uh, not to travel. The rights to start businesses, practice one religions, the list goes on and on. Education, uh, but as I said, in many places these rights uh, are not uh, enforced. So, as I said, access rights, and the third is solutions. 
And this is where I think the major problem actually exists in our refugee system. The, the picture is the flow. The picture of the people coming over the border is that iconic image of the, of the three-year-old boy who drowned and, and was found on a, uh, on a Turkish beach. Th those are the pictures we see. And those are terrible pictures. And 3,000 people that perish in the Mediterranean and thousands of people are sleeping out in the cold tonight on the way trying to get to, uh, to Europe. These are terrible stories. But in addition, there are millions of refugees who have been refugees for years. There are thousands of children born in refugee camps or in refugee settlements around the world who stay refugees most of their lives. And it's these long-standing situations, what are called in the business, protracted refugee situations, where the system has really collapsed. What's supposed to be a system that provides access rights and then a s solution has, is actually a system that provides assistance forever and dependency. And this is, the un, to me, the untold story of the refugee regime and where the work, where very serious work uh, needs to be done. Now, there will be some, uh, a number of conferences uh, this week, uh, this year, in 2016, that will try to uh, grapple with these issues. Uh, in fact, this week, there's a, what's called Syria 4, a funding conference in the UK to try to raise additional money for Syrian refugees. Later in March, there'll be a conference uh, in Geneva sponsored by UNHCR that will look for additional uh, legal pathways for Syrian refugees. So uh, not just through refugee admissions, but humanitarian admissions or perhaps labor visas or uh, additional family visas for Syrian refugees to reduce the numbers in, in the immediate hosting, uh, in the immediate hosting um, uh, countries. And then in New York uh, in September, um, there actually will be two summits. Uh, both the UN and the US have announced summits for the same day on the same topic. And there needs to be a little bit of work done here, Jesse, on this about how this will work out. But there, it shows great commitment from President Obama and from the Secretary General to say we will have, uh, um, we will have uh, conferences on beyond Syria on how to think about what is being called a global compact on responsibility sharing. How do we, how do we broaden the, uh, the, around the world the responsibility people take? Uh, Peter Sutherland, who is the Secretary General Special Representative uh, for uh, Migration and Development, has recently uh, taken to saying, you know, the, we're supposed to have a system of responsibility sharing, but what we have is responsibility based on proximity. And what he means by that is the hosting, the hosting for countries of first asylum, the countries next to the countries that are, are, are falling apart and are conflict-ridden and have produced refugees, they're bearing most of the uh, of the impact of refugees because the rest of the world uh, has, not stopped, has not stepped up. So if there were to be a global compact on responsibility sharing, it ought to first recognize that the hosting states are providing a global public good and they need to be assisted in that. And if they're not assisted, they will begin to close their borders and continue to deny rights. But there also has to be a step up in other things that, that other countries around the world can do. Resettlement numbers have to go up. We talk about the USCS is a very generous resettlement uh, program for other than Syrians, uh, taking 70, 80, maybe 100,000 uh, this year. Um, but out of think about that, even if there are 150,000 refugees resettled in a population of 15 million, my guess is there are more children born as refugees every year than actually resettled. So we're not, the resettlement needs to go up dramatically. Um, there needs to be assistance to hosting states. Development agencies need to come in and help work on infrastructure and jobs programs and others so that the refugees can be given an opportunity uh, to, to contribute to the states in which they reside and hosting states who have schools and clinics and electric grids and waste treatment plants that have been uh, overwhelmed, particularly around Syria, uh, need to be assisted. There needs to be a big effort on rights, refugee rights, and a guarantee that if there is more money for hosting states, that refugees will be given the right to work, the right to go to school, uh, the right to start businesses, the right to travel, and the like. And there needs to be a fundamental commitment to the principles Jesse described of uh, permitting access for people uh, to file uh, for asylum. So there's a lot of work to do in these global, uh, in these global meetings, and I hope they can make progress towards um, uh, uh, resolving some of the problems I've identified existing in the system today. But the United States has a lot of work to do as well. Thank you, I see you have two minutes, okay. Um, 
you know, first of all, um, the, uh, I've mentioned some of the deterrence measures, uh, and there'll be more, uh, Mary Ellen mentioned some, and there'll be more discussion of this. The detention at the southwest borders of women and children as a deterrent measure to stop people fleeing some of the most violent countries in the world, in Central um, uh, America. Um, there's a huge backlog in our asylum system now, so if you file a claim, it may be years before your asylum claim uh, is heard. Now some of that, um, well, okay, um, uh, right. Um, and then thirdly, on the resettlement side uh, for the United States, you know, it's just incredible to me that the idea that when the president says we'll admit 10,000 Syrian refugees, that you have two dozen governors of the states in this country saying we don't want them. I can't, I can't remember a time like that. I, I find it startling. I find it depress, depressing. Think of earlier times. After World War II, 400,000 refugees came into the United States under the Displaced Persons Act. 700,000 Cubans came to the United States in the 1960s and 70s. As part of a comprehensive plan on, on Vietnamese refugees, 100,000 Vietnamese were brought in to the United States. These were big numbers. And the fact that we're choking on 10,000 on some trumped up claims, sorry, bad word, on some, <laughs> on some, uh, just slipped out there, on some claims about security, you'll hear I'm sure from other speakers that the security um, that, that refugees go through is far higher than any others. We have an immigration system that emits a million people a year, gives them green cards. Tens of thousands of them are Muslims. And they go through a screening that is, is not as rigorous as what we do for refugees. So this has become a political debate. It's not a serious debate about a refugee system. And it's undercutting something that has been so deep and so true to this country forever, which is a belief that refugees are people that this country should step forward and protect. And I'm really distressed to see this. And I urge all of you in this Bar Association, this is a great city to do this and a great group to do this, to. I guess I've said before, you know, that what we say sometimes on the subway, if you see something, say something. I mean, when you see the kind of intolerance and the resistance to refugees in this country, say something about it. And I know the international human rights groups uh, here uh, cares deeply about this issue, and I hope all of you do and will get involved in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, our next speaker is Bill Freelich, and Bill is the uh, director of the refugee program at Human Rights Watch. He has uh, been a thorough researcher and tireless advocate for refugees for uh, many years now with several different organizations. He's somebody whose work has set the gold standard. I've read it often. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be able to hear his remarks tonight. Uh, and I know that Bill, although he uh, has information on every aspect of the refugee crisis with, we are facing, has, uh, we've asked him to focus on what's going on in the region around Syria, on the domino effects um, of the different countries' responses and non-responses, uh, and that's where our next uh, focus will be. Yes, uh, following um, Alex's very inspiring ending, but uh, you know when he's talking about the the, the, the international solidarity and um, as the foundation of what's sometimes called the refugee regime, um, we really are seeing a, a crumbling uh, of that now, and and um, I hope I will managed to get some inspiration in there, but it's going to be a fairly depressing picture that I'm painting for you. And I'm preoccupied, particularly with just the last couple of weeks, of things that have been happening in Europe, uh, which I'll, I'll uh, discuss. Um, but I did choose, you know, falling dominoes is, is sort of the image that, 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 uh, that I'm struggling with here. Um, first, just to, you know, lay some of the groundwork, which you, you've heard from, from Alex and Mary Ellen as well, um, that Europe has seen um, a million um, asylum seekers and migrants coming in in the last year, um, bearing in mind that there are four and a half uh, million Syrian refugees that are still in the region, and not to mention all the other millions of refugees, uh, as Alex said, 86% or whatever that 
fine percentages uh, that are, remain in the developing world, oftentimes in protracted situations. But of that million or so that, uh, that came in last year, estimated 84% of them are from the top 10 refugee producing countries, including 48% from Syria, 21% from Afghanistan, 9% from Iraq. These are you know, not countries that are producing economic migrants. In fact, you know, prior to 2011, there were hardly any Syrian asylum seekers or, or migrants for that matter coming into Europe. Um, this is very much uh, driven by the conflict there. Um, just to mention, I, I think most people here are probably familiar with Human Rights Watch, but we are fact finders. We go into the field um, and we've been uh, documenting both the human rights abuses in Syria, Iraq, uh, the, these places, uh, and then basically every single step of the, the way. And now increasingly we're looking at, at Europe and the closing of the doors uh, in Europe. Um, this last uh, year or so, I've been myself in Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, um, Bulgaria, Greece, Macedonia, Serbia. Um, I'm probably missing one of the countries in there. I, I, meant, I was thinking as I was about to start this, it would have been great to have had a map, but I'm assuming this is a well, well read and well traveled audience. So you know, uh, Europe, you'll, you'll know where Slovenia and Austria and whatnot uh, fit in. Um, but, but Europe, you know, basically the, the, this European Union enterprise is based on um, the, uh, the notion of free movement, the Schengen system as it's called, amongst the European member states. It's a membership organization, if you will. And, and one of the key concepts is that they have a common European asylum system, the idea that there's a harmonization of standards, there's a harmonization of procedures, a harmonization of reception conditions, so that a person that uh, is seeking asylum in Greece will essentially have the same chances that they would have in Sweden. Um, the reality, of course, is, has, has been seen um, through the stress and the strains of um, the large numbers of people and the chaotic uh, response to that, um, is that um, there, were, there were faults and now there are fissures and uh, the system has not been able to respond adequately. Um, the asylum approval rates in 2014 in Sweden were 77%. Uh, in Hungary, they were less than 10%, and there's a, sort of a mix all the way through, supposedly with common standards, common procedures, and you know, essentially the same um, profile of asylum seekers. Um, in 2011, you know, before this crisis really started, there is a European Court of Human Rights decision called MSS versus Belgium versus uh, uh, Greece, in which uh, the European Court of Human Rights basically said that an Afghan asylum seeker that had traveled through uh, Greece to Belgium couldn't be returned to Greece because um, of the inhuman and degrading conditions, reception conditions in Greece, even before we had this huge influx, uh, and that the, that, that the asylum seeker could not get an effective remedy on his asylum claim because of the dysfunctional asylum system there. And yet the system that, that was connected, um, as we heard from the, the State Department um, reference uh, earlier was is what's called the Dublin system, the idea that the place where you first enter is the country that's responsible for examining the asylum claim. Uh, and therefore, again, looking at a map, you would see that the interior countries are essentially insulated from, um, from having to examine asylum claims of people coming by land, coming through the external uh, members on the frontiers of the European Union, Malta, Greece, Bulgaria, and these countries, you know, as it turns out, are the ones with the least capacity to provide uh, decent reception conditions and fair processing. Um, and uh, that's essentially how the, the system has fallen apart. Um, we just heard about the, the global compact for responsibility sharing. And unfortunately, the, the bad news I'm gonna bring to you is that the, the pilot project for that, in some respects, is the relocation plan that the European Union tried to use when, when, when they found out that Dublin was a complete failure, um, to basically say, well, let's apportion these uh, asylum seekers that enter into the, um, the first states, and according to the capacity of other European member states to to receive them and to process them and eventually to integrate them, we will you know, make a, a fair distribution 
of these asylum seekers, and we'll only do it, we're, we're only talking about 160,000 people over a two-year period. And this, of course, at a time when 40,000 a month were coming in, into Greece. Um, and yet, uh, that was, um, with great opposition, particularly from a number of the East European countries, um, some of qualified majority voting, it was, it was made as this is uh, an obligation, and yet um, there's been essential refusal to cooperate. And the last statistic I saw, which is as of January 18th, um, there are only 322 people who have been relocated um, from Greece and Italy. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, is each sort of each man for himself, uh, each country putting up fences. And I'm sure anyone reading the papers are aware of Bulgaria and Hungary, uh, Hungary putting up a fence and and then declaring anyone that crosses that fence is then committing a criminal act. Um, and uh, the brutality that, w that we have documented, that I've documented personally, uh, in the case of Bulgaria, um, pushing people back and, and brutalizing them in the process um, is, is really shocking to the conscience. Um, and now, in addition to that, this month, start, actually last month, January, um, we've seen you know, Sweden, Germany, Denmark, all you know, for the first time since uh, the European Union enterprise, since Schengen, uh, putting in uh, border controls and barring uh, people that maybe are economic migrants, but they are um, stopping people at their borders. And we're seeing things like the, the Denmark passing a law um, to, um, to confiscate people's assets uh, over uh, 1,340 euros um, as uh, a, a supposedly a compensation for um, the services that will be rendered unto them, um, but it's done in um, what is unquestionably a, 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 a rationale of deterrence and um, of uh, unwelcome. Um, so what we're really seeing is now borders that are actually being closed, and they're being closed formally to any nationalities, according to nationality, other than Syrians, um, Iraqis, and Afghans. So those three have been somehow identified, um, and this started in November with Slovenia and Macedonia, basically saying only these, only these three nationalities would be able to, to pass uh, their borders. Um, and we saw, and we've interviewed and spoken to you know, Iranians and Eritreans and, and, and other nationalities uh, that have been stuck at those borders. Um, uh, one of them is a, a guy named Farad. We have a press release that should be coming out tomorrow that we'll talk about him. Um, he uh, was a democracy activist in Iran and uh, was imprisoned for five years in the Evan prison. Um, and he fled again when he uh, looked like he was about to be arrested and was facing another potential three year uh, prison sentence. He's one of those ones that's stuck on the Greek-Macedonian border, not able to to move forward um, because presumptively he's not a refugee because he doesn't happen to be one of the, the nationalities that is so recognized. Um, the, the Austrian government uh, has, just in the last uh, January 20th, the, the Chancellor, Werner Feynman, announced that, that Austria cannot accept everyone applying for asylum and has announced that Austria will cap the number of people that can be granted asylum based on 1.5% uh, of its uh, population and said that the number this year will be 37,500 is the maximum number that could be granted asylum in the country. Um, he hasn't explained, of course, what happens to <laughs> you know, the next person that comes up that has a well-founded fear of persecution um, and that needs protection. Um, this is not something like resettlement where you can go in and you can pick and choose people. These are people who appear um, in, at your border, in your territory, and, uh, and who you have a responsibility, an obligation, in fact, um, to, uh, to determine their claims if the consequence is going to be that they will be blocked and that blocking, again, think of these dominoes falling one after the other. Um, will eventually uh, result in refoulement. Um, so, 
since the Europeans have not been able to um, come to agreements amongst themselves, they haven't been able to do the, the relocation has basically failed. Um, the Dublin system has failed. Um, the latest thing we're hearing is Turkey will be our solution. We're going to externalize this, basically, and, and let Turkey basically stop this. They'll be the buffer zone. And again, if we had a map, it would be just gorgeous. You would see uh, Turkey is basically going to be the entryway for anyone coming through uh, from uh, Iran and Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria uh, coming into Greece, Bulgaria, and, and onward from there. Um, this externalization has been a very attractive idea. It's attractive to the United States uh, with respect to Central Americans using Mexico as a buffer zone or Australia uh, using uh, Nauru, Papua New Guinea or, or others to, to create a Pacific solution. Um, and November 30th, an action plan was announced uh, and uh, three billion euros were promised and dangling the promise of maybe eventual, maybe perhaps, who knows, eventual uh, EU membership, um, visa-free travel, uh, all as ways of basically containing this flow, stemming the flow, and having Turkey bear the burden. Um, Turkey already, with somewhere around two million uh, Syrian refugees, um, is you know certainly willing to take the money, but uh, what is the effect that we're seeing uh, already? First, there is the question. I mean, Alex basically identified both. The question of the rights regime within the country itself, and uh, we have a report that, that's out just a month ago on 80% of Syrian children outside of those, the few that are in the camps, um, aren't going to school. Uh, basic education needs are not being met. Um, a right to work, we actually just this week, it was announced that they're going to give refugees the right to work for the first time, Syrian refugees only, not others. Uh, we'll have to see the implementation of that to see whether that works. But more disturbingly, what we've been documenting, and, and again, go to our webpage, www.hrw.org, to see what's happening at the borders, not just in Turkey, but in Jordan and Lebanon as well, is they have closed the official crossing points. They've closed two, the two main official crossing points have been closed. And, and unfortunately, now it's not the case, as Mary Ellen was saying a moment ago, of people that are actually going you know, up to border guards. If you go up to the, the border guards in Macedonia, they're going to push you away. And if you try to get around them, they're going to beat you up and brutalize you. And it's the same with the Turkish border guards, uh, I'm sorry to say. And we're documenting uh, real brutal treatment of people, pushbacks that are occurring. Uh, on the uh, Syrian border. And one of the great worries is that the, uh, uh, President Erdogan and others in Turkey are talking about the creation of a safe zone, quote unquote, inside Syria on the Syrian side of the border um, that would be 68 miles long, 40 miles deep. Um, and that is what he says is the basis for the refugees' return, that basically we'll, we'll, we'll take this area and we'll call it safe. The geopolitics of that are pretty obvious in terms of Kurdish autonomy that's developing in the region. Um, there's you know, certainly more, it's not just a humanitarian uh, motive by any means. Um, and we have to remember Shrevenitsa and other similar uh, adventures in safe areas and what that actually means. This is all about containing refugee flows um, and we really have to insist on the right as was mentioned at the outset from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right to seek asylum to seek outside your country uh, to be able to go out um, and, uh, and have that chance. Um, just very, very quickly, because my time is up, um, Lebanon, again, you know, I, I hate to criticize Lebanon, has, has taken over a million refugees, 25% of, of its own population uh, is now uh, refugees, but they have imposed um, visa restrictions that, that essentially say being a refugee is not sufficient to be allowed into our country at this point. You have to have something, you know, of extreme vulnerability uh, above and beyond that uh, in order to come in. And we've just issued a report again, and the title of which is, I just wanted to be treated like a person about um, the rights regime that's completely eroded for Syrian refugees inside Lebanon. Um, uh, they're not allowing UNHCR to register them. They're not being allowed to work. Um, they're actually being deregistered uh, uh, at, a, at a very rapid pace. And in Jordan, um, we now have, and you can see again on our webpage, is the satellite images on what's called the berm. They, they have closed the official border crossings at all the, across where all the populated areas are, 
and people have had to go further and further, further east into the most godforsaken desert area. You look around, you feel like you're on the surface of the moon. And now there are 16,000 people that are encamped at the border there waiting to come across. And King Abdullah gave a, an interview yesterday, I think it was on the BBC, and he said, you know, if people are taking the moral high ground and criticizing us, other governments are criticizing us for, for not for allowing these 16,000 refugees to come in, um, we'd be happy to bring them to our air base and, and fly them right to your country and you can take every one of them. Um, I think there's a lot packed into that statement. Yes, there's a legal obligation on the part of Jordan for non refoulement of not sending those people back, but there's an incredible obligation on the part of the United States, on the part of all the other countries in the world, that really, there's no moral high ground. There's no, they, they, there's no ability even to criticize because there is an unwillingness to share, do I hesitate to say the word, the burden of, of providing decent lives for millions and millions of people fleeing persecution and war. So you can move around in your chair for a moment. Uh, but as soon as he's finished doing that, uh, we'll turn to Eleanor Acer, our, our next speaker. Uh, Eleanor is the head of the Refugee Protection Program at Human Rights First. Uh, and for those of you in New York, uh, she is a giant in the human rights community and in the immigration community. Uh, I think she has... Uh, developed more programs and assisted more lawyers in helping vulnerable refugees and immigrants than uh, anyone else sitting in, uh, in the audience or maybe of my, my knowledge. Uh, Eleanor is going to talk to us tonight about the refugee resettlement debate within the United States, uh, about some of the refugee resettlement uh, issues in the United States, and also about some of the uh, concerns we have about refugees coming across the southern border. Thank you so much, Marianne. And thank you, um, Marianne. Um, thank you <clears throat> to the Bar Association, to the Human Rights Committee, the Immigration Committee, um, and to my co-panelists. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to apologize at the beginning. I'm <clears throat> coming off of a really bad cough and cold, so if I clear my throat a bit or need to reach for some water, please have some patience with me. Um, myself and a colleague went uh, recently, um, we just came back like two weeks ago, uh, to Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey to look mostly at, at a U.S. resettlement processing, but we spoke with a lot of aid workers, we spoke with refugees there. Um, you know, you've heard a lot about the, the research that Human Rights Watch has done in the area, and, and it, 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 we came back with an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. Uh, we'd been there about a year ago, and then a year before that, and just the, the absolute lack of hope that refugees have, that people working with refugees have, um, the shift in the, the, the local communities, uh, it, it was actually, it was incredibly depressing. You know, of course, I mean, you know, we're now heading uh, into yet another anniversary of the conflict there. Um, it's raging without resolution. In fact, you know, it's been escalating with the <clears throat> engagement of the Russians and the spread of ISIL. After years of living as refugees, many families have depleted their savings with humanitarian appeals not met. Uh, families can't feed their children. People, uh, we heard again and again about just basic medical needs and critical medical needs not being able to be met. There have been cuts in medical um, <clears throat> assistance. Refugees, as you know, um, those of you who work with, with uh, asylum seekers, you know that, that they want to work to support their families. But, you know, as the host states who have not been given the support that they need through either through assistance and resettlement and other measures um, are <clears throat> becoming more and more inhospitable, refugees are facing more and more risks. Uh, if they try to work uh, illegally, they face risks of detention and deportation. Uh, those who are working are often, you know, exploited incredibly. Uh, many families have made the very difficult decision to pull their kids from school because if, their children, if the children work, 
they face less risk of being caught and detained. Um, that Can you imagine as a parent making that kind of decision? How do you feed your family? Uh, you, the only choice is to send a child to work. Uh, in Jordan, uh, UNICEF has said that half of the families have children as primary or joint primary breadwinners. That, that's just mind boggling to me. Um, many parents are saying, some said to us, some said to other aid workers that they've been uh, interacting with regularly, they just cannot support their families. They can't survive any longer this many years uh, living as refugees and, and just straining to survive. As Bill has detailed, host states are imposing incredible restrictions. Uh, the restrictions in Lebanon on registration, refugees can't even you know, re-register. The processes are so incredibly complicated and they're clearly designed to send a message to leave and for new refugees not to come. The restrictions at borders have effectively slammed the door in the faces of refugees who should be allowed under international, under customary international law, certainly, even though these aren't um, convention signatories, um, uh, other than Turkey, which is complicated, <laughs> to cross the borders. Um, when we were in Lebanon, uh, we were there uh, just as Turkey's new visa restrictions were going into effect, and we heard reports that people were literally, Syrians were on, on planes and headed to Turkey, were literally pulled off the plane because the plane would arrive after the, border the new visa restrictions went into effect, and that several hundred were, were actually returned to Syria. So there's no way out for people, uh, for many people who are uh, stuck within the country now, and little hope of really finding refuge or rebuilding their lives in neighboring states. Uh, many continue to indicate an intent to go to Europe if their situations don't improve. Uh, CARE, I think, just released a survey um, in Jordan that indicated that roughly half of the refugees there were thinking of taking the dangerous trip to Europe if they couldn't um, live with some kind of dignity, if they couldn't work to support their families um, or receive enough assistance that they could actually keep, um, you know, keep feeding their families and living, uh, sending their children to school. <clears throat> you know, there's, this isn't about economic migration, just listening to this discussion of, of secondary movement. This is not like, let's go find a better place. It's, it, it's about survival. There's much that the United States can and should do to address the Syrian refugee crisis and the global crisis. Um, coming back, I guess, uh, from this most recent trip, I, I actually found myself wondering, you know, is it too late? You know, did we, did the international community, you know, we've missed, we missed the opportunity to really lead and do the things that needed, need to get done. Um, but, but there is still a great deal that, that, that can and, and must be done. The United States needs to play a strong role and more of a leadership role along with other states in advancing really a, a more comprehensive approach. It's great to hear that there's now some more uh, comprehensive thinking about how to deal with this situation, not just looking at, at kind of providing humanitarian aid. Um, there certainly needs to be increased humanitarian assistance, but also much more development investment in frontline refugee hosting countries. And the United States needs to be a strong and principled advocate for the rights of refugees. And this is going to be even more important um, over the coming months and years as the situation plays out. Um, it needs to be a strong proponent for the right to seek asylum, the right for ref of refugees to cross borders, and their right to work. The United States also needs to significantly increase resettlement uh, and, and work with other states to encourage more resettlement and humanitarian admissions. And it's good to hear you know, more discussions on, on that issue and, and that the United States is looking at, at how to encourage other states uh, to do more. But the United States has not been leading on Syrian resettlement. The US has long been the global leader on resettlement and it really hasn't been leading at all on Sy with respect to Syrian resettlement for the last two years. Not until late last year, when the pictures of boats, uh, boats of refugees desperately trying to reach Europe, reached the media headlines, did the administration begin to become more engaged? Secretary Kerry late last year announced a US commitment to resettle at least 10,000 Syrian refugees, which is a very modest commitment considering the scope and scale of the crisis and the US's historical position as the global leader on refugee resettlement. 
a bipartisan group of former government officials, U.S. government officials, as well as Human Rights First and many other refugee advocacy organizations, had called on the United States to commit to resettle at least 100,000 Syrian refugees and 200,000 refugees globally. Now, that sounds huge, uh, but the U.S. does resettle every year 70,000 refugees, and Alex gave us a sense of the history of major, major resettlement initiatives by the United States. Compared to this country's capacity, these numbers are really small. In fact, some of you might have seen Oxfam issued a fair share analysis uh, just this week, and it concluded that you know even though the, the U.S. is actually the number one donor um, to, to much of the humanitarian initiatives, but the U.S. has comparatively provided only 76% of its fair share of assistance, and with respect to Syrian resettlement pledges, not even where it is so far, so pledges, um, only 7% of its fair level of resettlement for Syrian refugees. And this is from the global leader in resettlement, a country that typically takes over half of resettled refugees, only 7% of its fair share. As you all know, I, or have seen, <laughs> over the last two months, the issue of Syrian refugee resettlement has become a bit of a hot button, uh, and it's become you know, very mixed up in um, the campaign politics, in multiple campaign politics. Claims that terrorists would try to infiltrate the very complicated uh, and multi-step uh, U.S. resettlement program abounded, um, and some have call, called for a total ban on Muslims coming to the United States. In Washington, within days of the attacks in Paris, I think over 30 governors, um, overwhelmingly Republican, I think there was one Democrat, called for a pause or a halt in the resettlement of Syrian refugees to their states. Some members of Congress moved quickly to try to move ahead a bill called the uh, American Security Against Foreign Enemies Act of 2015, or the American SAFE Act. The bill, if it was enacted, would bring U.S. resettlement of Syrian and Iraqi refugees, which already moves at a snail's pace, to a grinding halt. It creates this very complicated certification process and requires the Secretary of Homeland Security <clears throat> the FBI director and the director of national intelligence to certify that each individual Syrian or Iraqi refugee, whose case has already been fully vetted by uh, multiple uh, security agencies, intelligence agencies, and a whole ream of other officials, uh, that each individual refugee's case they have to certify does not present a security threat to the United States. Now, these are high-level U.S. government officials who have a lot of important national security responsibilities, but instead they're going to sit there and certify the case of each individual Syrian and Iraqi refugee to the United States. Anyone who knows anything about how the U.S. resettlement process already works and how slow it is and how cumbersome it is and how incredibly difficult it is to get anything done that requires multi-agency coordination knows that this is a proposal meant to really bring the program uh, to its knees. You know, of course, it's important for American leaders and Americans living in communities where refugees are resettled to understand that, in fact, um, refugees are fully vetted before they come here. There have been multiple efforts, uh, bipartisan efforts, uh, by very you know, senior former government officials to educate, um, educate uh, members of Congress and governors about the vetting process, uh, former DHS Secretary Michael Chertoff, who was DHS Secretary under the Bush administration, along with uh, Janet Napolitano, um, they wrote a letter uh, detailing how the U.S. resettlement process is the most you know, robust resettlement. Syrian refugees are more robustly resettled than others. Former INS commissioners Jim Ziegler and Doris Meisner, again in a bipartisan effort, uh, you know, have, have written uh, similar letters and an op-ed. Um, a bipartisan group of incredibly high-level officials uh, wrote a letter that we helped to organize, but this was former CIA directors, national security directors, secretaries of state, national security advisors, um, detailing how this process is, um, you know, the most robust process there is, but that resettlement is an important reflection of American ideals, it's who we are, and, and it also advances U.S. national security interests. 
you know, resettlement is only one piece of the puzzle, but why, why does it matter? What does it do? Um, so in addition to helping a very small portion of people, it also helps to support those frontline states. Along with assistance and aid, it helps to encourage them, hopefully, to respect the rights of people there, to let them stay there, um, you know, and to really demonstrate that other countries are helping to share the responsibility of hosting these refugees. It, it also, from a practical national interest perspective, can be incredibly helpful. Uh, the stability of the Middle East and, and key allies like Jordan is important to U.S. national security interests. Um, this, you know, supporting our allies in Europe should also be important to the United States. So there, there's a lot of important reasons um, for resettling refugees. We had, oh, we're running out of time. I better bounce from all that. So, you know, one thing that was really disturbing in the region is that many refugees we heard were actually pulling out of resettlement. The process took so long um, in some cases that they were actually pulling out. So the process needs to be sped up. Um, I know the, the U.S. has argued that, well, the process is safe because it's so slow, but we have tremendous backlogs in our system. There are over half of the cases um, of Syrians are put into this sort of backlog of waiting for their no decision situation to be resolved. So we need more DHS officers uh, to review backlogged no decision cases, more officers to uh, s sort through security vetting, and we also need um, we need a, a lot more uh, resources for security vetting agencies to actually handle these cases in a timely manner. The other important thing that the U.S. needs to do is to set a better example here at home in terms of its own asylum policies. Um, about a year ago, in response to an increase in children and families coming to the southern border from Central American countries seeking protection, the U.S. implemented a very harsh policy. Um, a centerpiece of that pol pol policy was the use of expedited removal and detention for families. The policy was driven by immigration enforcement considerations and political calculations relating to immigration politics rather than refugee protection and rights respecting migration management. Many of the families were held in these facilities for three months, six months, nine months, a year. Um, I'm sure some of you have probably been to these family detention facilities. It, they're awful. Um, medical professionals have confirmed that detaining children, even for shorter periods of time, is very damaging to their, um, to their health and their long-term development. And U.S. detention policies for children and for adults um, are totally inconsistent with our human rights commitments, uh, with the ICCPR and with uh, the refugee protocol. Uh, I look forward to discussing uh, these issues uh, of domestic refugee protection during our Q&A since my time is done. But I just want to say in closing that I know many of you are representing individual asylum seekers on a pro bono basis, some of them Central American families, some of them unaccompanied, uh, some un unaccompanied children too, perhaps some of you even have some Syrian asylum cases. Uh, many of you have no doubt been to immigration detention facilities you know what a critical difference a lawyer can make and how impossible it is for asylum seekers to navigate their way through our process without legal counsel. You also know how much more difficult it is uh, when your client is put into immigration detention or put onto some kind of rocket docket that's meant to send a message. Um, or alternatively, given the delays and the understaffing in our immigration courts and asylum office, how harmful it is for an asylum seeker to have to wait years to have their case resolved. Thank you so much, and I look forward to more discussion during our Q&A. Thank you, Eleanor. And our, our next speaker, and let me just mention that after our next speaker, we are going to take a pause and have a Q&A session, uh, and then we'll reconvene for a, a last uh, formal presentation before we break out the wine and cheese and the opportunity for you to sign up for pro bono uh, representation efforts. Uh, but our next speaker is Steve Pellet, who is the legal director of the Iraqi uh, Refugee Assistance Project. Sorry, it started as the Iraqi Refugee Assistance Project. Uh, it is now the uh, International? International Refugee Assistance Project. And we've heard um, about how big a problem this is and how many of us feel close to despair. Um, 
But Steve didn't despair. As a 1L student in law school, he started a new program to assist refugees. And he's here to tell us about that tonight and about how to make a difference. Thanks so much to the New York City Bar for uh, inviting us to speak and, and for putting together this panel. And it's, I'm very lucky to get to work with so many lawyers, part of the New York City Bar, on a, on a daily basis to help refugees. Tonight, I wanna talk about three things. First, the uh, adjudications, international refugee adjudications in countries of first asylum. There uh, is comparatively more familiarity with domestic asylum procedures in the US. There are also foreign country procedures outside uh, the US internationally done by foreign governments. But the, the area where, where I work and where I, I'd like to share a little bit about is uh, international adjudications, adjudications by the US government or by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, UNHCR, that uh, affect refugees and our clients. Refugees who are fleeing persecution must go through a series of complex legal adjudications before international decision makers to seek protection and potentially life-saving resettlement to a safe country like the US. When IRAP started its work in 2008, we, we worked with an immigration lawyer who presented a training on uh, asylum law and, and law in the US and presented the USCIS affirmative asylum process and the immigration uh, court process and the federal courts and then drew a big dark circle on the other side of the board and said, this is the black hole. You guys are working in the black hole. And I, I, that isn't accurate entirely. The UNHCR has published procedures for refugee status determinations. The US resettlement system is part of the INA, the, the, the CFR, it is uh, determined by administrative manuals. But overcoming this sentiment and recognizing that these are legal procedures that lawyers who are based in the, in, in the US or who are familiar with international law and are working abroad can help intervene and protect the, the rights of refuge, refugees is crucial in making sure that refugees can fairly access protection and their rights. <coughs> Second, I wanna talk about some of the very real challenges that exist for refugees. The, the UN and the US systems are have limited resources and they are staffed by well-trained, well-meaning and deeply committed individual staff who are giving the incredibly difficult task of applying complex law to individuals who are often traumatized and, and very desperate for uh, assistance. Adjudicators have to make credibility assessments and decisions in a very limited time with a very large case docket to make sure that these resettlement programs are able to reach enough individuals. But uh, the applicants who generally have no access to legal assistance or a clear understanding of the process uh, face real challenges and in this procedural system that exists, serious mistakes can be made with life and death consequences for some of the most vulnerable refugees. So the, the third thing I wanna talk about is that following from those first two points, complex legal adjudications with a significant chance of error, having a legal advocate can be sometimes one of the most effective ways and, and sometimes the only way to protect uh, your, your human rights. So I, I want to break down and discuss some of the steps in this process for an individual who is in a country of first asylum in Jordan, in, in Egypt, Turkey, Lebanon, and is seeking refugee protection. And there are numerous steps, and each of these is vital to the integrity of the system to make sure that it protects individuals who are, in fact, fleeing persecution and fit under the, the 1951 convention. But uh, it, it is, as I, as I mentioned, challenging for individuals who are, who are going through this process and who have had to flee their homes and are in uh, incredibly difficult situations. So oftentimes this process begins with registration with the UNHCR. In many countries, because they're not signatories to the 1951 convention, don't have an asylum uh, system, UNHCR has become the adjudicator of refugee claims. And this is not just in the Middle East, but in many, many parts of the world. Uh, and even this first step of approaching UNHCR, providing bio data in the Middle East, having 
iris scans and a, and a summary of their refugee claim can be uh, challenging. This seems simple, and UNHCR has registered millions of refugees, but for, for some of our clients, uh, for instance, one who was a 22-year-old Syrian refugee who had fled with his family after <coughs> the government began suspecting all families in the neighborhood uh, of being affiliated with the rebels. Uh, he registered with his family in a country, <coughs> in a crowded community center, in a, in a public setting. And one of the other reasons that he was fearing persecution was that he was gay. And he had a relationship in this country where he uh, had, had sought refuge and the host country government had found out about it. But he didn't feel comfortable disclosing that. And this is true of many of our LGBTI refugee clients who make a, a significant portion of the individuals who we assist. Sometimes simply approaching uh, the UN can be difficult without uh, an advocate. And <clears throat> for most Syrian refugees right now in the Middle East, registration is uh, what, what happens and is what you would need to do in order to get protection and assistance. But in many other places and in the Middle East for other refugee populations, uh, individuals need to go through a refugee status determination before an international adjudicator to have the 1951 convention definition applied to determine if they have a well-founded fear <coughs> of persecution. In these refugee claim assessments before international adjudicators, there are uh, significant challenges. I think of one refugee family that I worked with, a Christian family that had fled to Lebanon in, in 2013 after their child had begun receiving threats. The threats escalated and the family fled to, to Lebanon and claimed refugee status. Their case was denied and in the denial letter, the UN had written that they had searched for any country of origin information in uh, their town concerning attacks on Christians. And the family had received this letter but didn't understand it. And when I was able to explain that to them, they opened up uh, the computer that I had and they went to a blog that was in uh, a Syrian, a Neo-Aramaic language that contained photos and postings over the last year of attacks in this, in this particular village. And uh, thanks to the, the, the work that some of our lawyers did after that, they were able to appeal. They're now in Canada. And this is a particularly important case considering that years later, the, that particular town was occupied by, by ISIS and with uh, everyone who was still in the town facing serious persecution. For refugees who are recognized by the UNHCR, a small minority of them will be referred for resettlement. The UNHCR assesses individual refugees for vulnerability, applying the UNHCR resettlement handbook criteria, which st stress protection needs that can't be addressed in countries of first asylum, legal and protection needs, survivors of violence and torture who have ongoing needs in the country where they have fled, medical needs that can't be addressed. So individuals for whom there's no type of immediate humanitarian assistance that can keep them safe in the country. Uh, and, and this is why resettlement can be so vital uh, for, the, for these individuals to protect them. But at the same time, resettlement can also intersect with various legal needs and lawyers and other advocates can, can help individuals in this regard. We worked with one particular Sudanese client who was initially referred for resettlement and got married and the case went on hold. The husband later became abusive and she was in hiding in, in various shelters, but no one had explained to her the significance of seeking her legal rights to divorce and custody and the way that that interacted with resettlement and that she perhaps couldn't seek uh, and, and receive resettlement without first seeking legal assistance in the country of asylum. And so without an advocate, without someone to, to help with the process, this would be quite difficult for, for her. For cases that are referred for resettlement, the, the other panelists have mentioned that the US takes by far the largest number of refugees for, for resettlement. And for the US refugee admissions program, cases can, and can enter and they're prioritized by the US. There are three priority categories that uh, the US accepts. Priority one, which are cases that are referred by the UNHCR, 
or by a U.S. embassy, priority two, which are individuals who can apply directly to the U.S., and priority three, which are family reunification cases, which end up being a, a fairly small subset. In addition to the, the work that uh, is done to assist refugees in the, the UN and the, the, the UN re recognition, registration, and resettlement processes, individuals who are trying to apply directly to the US uh, could include Iraqis who have worked by or on behalf of the US government and have US affiliations and their family members. This is a vital program for Iraqis who have served with the US who are being targeted on that basis and it has saved the lives of, of, of tens of thousands of individuals. Uh, but it is also a potentially challenging program to access for individuals. One of our clients was an interpreter for the US Army and in 2012 a militia had left a threat letter on his car saying that he was a traitor to his religion and would be killed for his work. It also warned, warned him that if he didn't uh, leave uh, immediately, he and his family would be killed. And so he fled and went into hiding with his, his infant daughter. And he applied to the direct access program, which means that he, in fact, did not need to leave his country, which is significant. As we mentioned, most refugees have to cross an international border to be recognized under international law. But under US law, the president can designate certain populations that they can apply within their home country. For Iraqis, who often can't get a visa to, to go to Jordan, to Turkey, to other countries, this is particularly significant. <laughs> but in order to access this program, the individual had to prove his US work to the, 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 the United States. And the, what they require is a letter of employment from your employer. And he had reached out to his employer, which was the main contractor for interpreters in the US, and received a statement that said, that all local nationals on the contract were independent contractors assigned to a variety of subcontractor companies. Because independent contractors are not employees, employment records do not exist regardless of the company assigned. We apologize for the inconvenience. And so this individual was faced with persecution because of the work, a program existed to help him, but legal barriers for him outside of the US were being thrown up in, in sort of every in every way, only with the uh, assistance of his former military supervisors who were identified through volunteer attorneys were we able to uh, actually identify and help this individual qualify. For each individual case in the, the US refugee admissions program, these cases are pre-screened by resettlement support centers around the, the world that are contracted by the US government and they also go through a US Citizenship and Immigration Services adjudication. <laughs> in uh, a recent New York Times Magazine article, the, the state, a State Department official described it as one heck of an interview. And that people have to be prepared for this interview, and if they're caught lying, they're not going to make it no matter how worthy. And this is certainly something that we would agree with as uh, helping individuals who go through these adjudications to understand what the adjudication will entail, the fact that it in, involves the refugee definition, and so the, the well-founded fear of persecution rather than perhaps the very real fears and challenges that you're facing in your country of refuge. We represented one client, a woman who had worked for many years as a human rights organizer in, <coughs> in Iraq whose organization received funding from USAID forced into hiding by a militant, she applied to come to the US where her parents are citizens. She waited three years for an answer from Homeland Security, only to be denied on the basis that under the Saddam Hussein regime, she was convicted of a crime because a man who she had proposed to and rejected had kidnapped her, drugged her, forced her to sign a marriage certificate, and abused her for several weeks, and then later sued her for alimony. She had been found guilty, the conviction was later vacated, but this was the, the basis. And this is not an easy determination, maybe under US law, but it certainly is one where uh, legal advocacy can, can be important. In these interviews, refugees are barred under USCIS policy from having lawyers present, with a small exception 
that was only recently introduced for US affiliated Iraqis. And in working in those uh, adjudications, they are both incredibly helpful and not stymieing the process. The New York City Bar Immigration Committee, as well as the ABA and other organizations has joined uh, IRAP in calling for a change to this policy. Other challenges facing refugees include lack of information on denial letters and, of course, the very long security screening process. So I've given a picture of a process that is focused on the challenges and missteps, but uh, I would not necessarily suggest that these are representative of the average case or that the mistakes are a large percentage, but I would say that the problems are systemic in that these challenges cut across the system and the causes overwhelmed adjudicators, complex law, vulnerable and traumatized clients, and a lack of access to legal assistance will continue and show the need for more precautions and more assistance in terms of protecting individual applicants' dignity and, and human rights. Thank you, Stephen. So now it's your turn. You have attentively listened to the speakers. They've talked about a lot of things, a lot of places, a lot of people, and we're gonna have respond to them, and then, uh, then we'll collect the next three questions uh, so we can hear a variety of, of comments and uh, perspectives from audience members. So let us have a microphone go over there. Sorry, hi. Um, I guess as I've been listening to this, one thing that's been resonating within my head is that I think we need to add an additional phrase to that sentence, and that is the refugee crisis in the context of inequality. Because the real issue here when you talk about the resettlement is jealousy amongst people who have their own existing problems, and it's, an, and it's a common thing after any sort of disaster. I mean, I worked in Haiti after the giant earthquake, and the big issue is, is you come in with your huge trucks, here you go, you know, earthquake survivor, here you go, but then there's all these people who are still quite destitute who are their neighbors. So I think in any sort of planning, in any sort of initiative, or even in analyzing and raising these issues, we really have to look at the context that a lot of these countries that are currently on the front lines of hosting, or even here in the US, also have their own internal struggles. And the issue really becomes, how is integration going to happen in the context of inequality? Thank you. We have a, a next question, comment. Thank you. Um, under international law, are the what is the status of the hereditary nature of refugees? I'm I'm thinking of the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, so on where you have children, grandchildren, probably now great-grandchildren, uh, does the convention and other applicable law extend beyond the original refugees? And if so, how far down the family chain? Okay, can we have a third question? Hi, thank you very much. My question is about um, statelessness. I am conducting research on statelessness, and obviously UNHCR has a mandate that also covers statelessness, but I would love to hear the thoughts of, from some of the other organizations about how they see the issue of statelessness fitting into the refugee issue in terms of Syrian refugees without documentation or the situation in the Sudan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, so now I'm going to ask the panelists uh, to, to volunteer to respond, and uh, we're going to share microphones. Each side uh, of the dais has two microphones, uh, and I'll try to play traffic cop up here. Um, we have a volunteer to go first to respond to any or all of the comments. Turn that on. 
Um, I, I'm happy to address a, a few of them um, in part, and, but I hope others can comment with more uh, firsthand knowledge. I mean, I, the, on the first one, I, uh, with uh, about um, you know the inequality issues that you mentioned, I think those are very real, and I think that they've uh, been growing importance over the last two years about understanding that you know the humanitarian side of the international system and the development side don't really talk to each other very well, but I think there have been a lot of efforts recently to kind of break down those barriers and to view these things holistically. I think there's been work being done at the World Bank to uh, make middle in income countries like Jordan eligible for certain kinds of um, concessionary loans. So I'm not an expert, but I think that's the kind of trend that we're seeing. Um, uh, you know, there are definitely two different worlds that, you know, will have to work out, you know, system integration, but I think um, there's a recognition that uh, that you know that there th those types of inequalities can uh, fester if if not uh, addressed properly. Um, I'm glad you mentioned, uh, sir, uh, Palestinian refugees. I don't think any of us really mentioned those, and um, they're worth mentioning because it's almost a separate uh, system uh, for Palestinian refugees. It's actually a carve out in the Refugee Convention for uh, essentially Palestinian refugees because prior to the Refugee Convention, there already was. Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how formal it was, whether the UN General Assembly resolutions had already been passed, but essentially a recognition that there were Palestinian refugees. Um, yeah, they must have predated it. So anyway, there's a special UN agency called UNRWA, the UN uh, Relief and Works Agency for the, I think, Palestinian territories, and um, that, that handles assistance for Palestinians. Um, and, and so unless they lose protection under that agency, they're essentially exempt from being a, a convention refugee. Um, and I think the rules actually for hereditary status are different for Palestinian refugees, um, but uh, you know, they, they, that does pass down. Um, I think it's a little bit more complicated for convention refugees because uh, one of the concepts we haven't really discussed is the concept of prima facie refugees. Um, I know we're throwing a lot of terms out there, but that's when you know you have kind of a mass group of people cross a border. Think the Somalis who came into Kenya. You know, it's not feasible to just individually interview them all at once. So Kenya granted them all prima facie refugee status, and uh, it's only if they were ever to be returned that you know, there'd be an individual assessment. And I think in those types of contexts, you have kind of the status passed down. Um, but like in the U.S., if you're granted asylum, I think you were your family can, can, can kind of join your case, can get certain benefits from that. They, they wouldn't be specifically called refugees, though, uh, it, it, but essentially they, they, they get similar benefits um, as your family member. So, sorry, it's a little complicated. But statelessness, there um, are two statelessness conventions. Um, the U.S., as you probably know, is not a party to those, but for a couple of technical reasons about um, our domestic law, but I think we, we support them. Um, we support the current UNHCR campaign, the 10-year campaign to end statelessness. We factor that into our advocacy around the world uh, with these protracted situations of statelessness, stateless people um, uh, very strongly. So it's, it's certainly a, a major issue of concern for the U.S. Just very briefly, um, uh, the UNHCR position on generations of refugees, and this, unless there's been a durable solution for a refugee, then the children of refugees are refugees because you're still living in this un uncertain status. And the problem is you do have third generation, fourth generation refugees, but that, I mean, that goes to the fact that these situations are not solved and the parents, the parents, the parents are not, giving a, not given a durable solution that reunites them with a political community. Sorry, on, uh, on U.S. law and the need for more protections for stateless persons here in the United States, um, you know, some stateless people can be eligible for asylum, but there is a real gap in protection uh, for stateless persons. And, and there was a provision included, I think, in the Refugee Protection Act, which was just a bill introduced, but also in the Senate Immigration Reform Bill. And you know, I would just flag that on issues of asylum, statelessness, and also resettlement, um, I really do think that the New York City Bar Association can make a huge, huge difference. Uh, New York's senior senator is going to be playing an even greater role, um, you know, going forward uh, in the Senate. And, you know, 
very important, I think, for New Yorkers who care about issues of protection for all of these populations to be uh, raising those issues and um, standing up for, for these populations and you know, bringing the legal expertise that the Bar Association has uh, to the table as well. Thank you. Bill? Just quickly, sort of maybe even combining statelessness and, and um, inequality a little bit. Um, and uh, given your experience in Haiti as well, uh, you know, I certainly think back to um, the in-country processing in the mid-90s of Haitians and how illiterate Haitians really didn't have a chance, you know, and, and, um, and the whole thing was predicated almost on, on, on being able to pass uh, papers back and forth and have to actually have a telephone that you could be contacted and this sort of thing for the interviews. Um, so illiterate, um, uh, poor refugees are really disadvantaged in a lot of ways and I don't think very much attention is paid to that. And you see it in, 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 various, in various iterations in various places. And I would mention uh, the Rohingya, who are a stateless population in places like Bangladesh, where um, you know, there are maybe you know, 20,000, 30,000 that are officially the refugees that came in the early 1990s. Um, but then there must be 200,000 or more um, that don't, they, they are not allowed to lodge claims, they don't have any humanitarian assistance, they don't have any, any sort of recognition at all, and yet many of them have fled, and some of them rel relatively recently, from real serious persecution um, inside Burma, and, um, and yet you know, they, they really don't get the time of day. So, um, and, and oftentimes are, are, are you know, treated as economic migrants, basically, because they are impoverished, and I think it's one of the important concepts to, to understand that the fact that you may have an economic motivation, you know, doesn't forfeit your claim to being a refugee, and I think that often happens. Thank you. Uh, could we have some more questions or comments from the, from the audience? Given that the U.S. does fund quite a bit of the programs um, for humanitarian relief and also provides a significant amount to the UNHCR, I'm curious what, if anything, in the request for funding could be done to mandate that programs need to start considering as a factor offering legal assistance with those programs. For example, if they're going to offer a work-related program in those communities, that they then have legal support to work with the local communities for work visas or something of that sort. I have seen it because as caveat, I worked at PRM a year and a half ago. Thank you. Okay, uh, and we'll have first uh, this gentleman right over here and then the third one over here. Uh, hi, Michael Cooper, I chair the UN committee here and I'm active on the Immigration and Nationality Law Committee. I'm wondering about, it seems to me that in the public imagination there's this sort of bifurcation um, with migrants. You're either a refugee or you're an economic migrant. And, uh, but we all know that there's a sort of a third category, at least, of forced migrants. And uh, under European law, there's a little bit more recognition for forced migrants because you have this concept of subsidiary protection, I guess. But I'm wondering if there's anything that this community can do or a um, way of thinking about how we interject this idea that there may be those who don't meet the convention definition of refugee, but are still, um, still need some sort of protection. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my question is basically related to the Haitians who have been living in Dominican Republic for over six, seven years. And I believe, uh, again, it's all things that I've read and heard from, not facts that I know. Uh, they are right now, they're living uh, in between the borders of Haiti and Dominican Republic. I was told that they're being ignored by the international community. Do you consider them refugees? What status do you give them? I, mean, I would assume if they have Haitian parents, they're still Haitians, if they're second generation or generation of Haitians. But my key concern is I've heard that the international community is basically ignoring them, and as well as basically probably the Haitian government does not have enough resources to address their concerns. I would like to know what can your organization do on their behalf. Thank you. 
thank you. And before I let the panelists uh, comment, I just want to interject on behalf of the uh, International Human Rights Committee um, that we have uh, just prepared a letter and advocacy efforts regarding that very situation. Uh, the, the, uh, the Dominican Republic uh, expulsion of many uh, people of Haitian descent. Uh, so our committee is working on it, but there's a lot more work to be done. Now, uh, to, to broaden that up, not just to my response from the committee, uh, let me start with this side of the panel to, for some responses, Eleanor and Steve. So I, I'm just gonna touch on the question relating to additional protections for individuals who are you know, not eligible for asylum and, and look at the US perspective right now. Um, there is cat protection, there is asylum. But you know, there's many people fleeing life-threatening dangers in this country that you know do not have uh, any kind of real form of protection, and that's a huge gap in the United States. Um, you know, you have some of the Central American families. You know, many maybe el should be eligible for asylum, but some you know will not be yet. They would face you know death and 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 serious harm if if, if returned. So. Um, this is a huge issue in the United States and one that really should be uh, dealt with, things like um, you know, deferred departure and, and prosecutorial discretion leave people really in limbo for a long time. Um, you know, many, um, we just signed up, we joined a, an effort to push and encourage temporary protected status for uh, people from the Northern Triangle countries, and I, the, any of you who are familiar with TPS knows that, know that it is you know, highly, highly flawed. Um, you know, not, not, not much form of protection, but at least some kind of temporary protection. Uh, but, you know, that's a political uphill battle because even though, you know, to some extent the situation is the kind of classic situation that really, you know, should, should, people should be eligible for temporary protected status, TPS is so politicized that, uh, you know, it's very unlikely to happen. So, um, anyway, I'll just leave it at that and say, yes, it's a huge gap in the U.S. <laughs> Thanks. Steve, do you want to pipe in? Sure. I, I mean, on the question of legal assistance, I think it's tremendously important. And I think there are, th uh, one, in terms of local legal assistance in countries of asylum, I know that PRM does uh, fund that. And in terms of the refugee recognition and, and U.S. resettlement processes, I think there's also a lot of things that can be done without funding just to recognize the role that legal assistance can play in the process, allowing lawyers to be present, allowing individuals to see if there's a piece of evidence that is being considered against them, making sure that individuals have a, a reasoned decision about their case, which is something that the UN does, but the, the US uh, does not do, instead relying on a, a, a form letter. So there, there are things that both uh, could be done with, with funding and also things that are really important that don't necessarily need, need any additional funding. Thanks. And Bill? Yeah, I mean, just quickly on the, the Haitians, Human Rights Watch did a report within the, the year, uh, the, the last year, on Haitians in the Dominican Republic. And the, fo the focus of the report was really on statelessness and on um, you know, the attempts to try to, um, to give citizenship status to people that, that wanted to be in the DR. And there were some reforms that were taking place. I, I can't go into all the details because I frankly don't remember them all. Um, but uh, this has been continuing now with quite a number of other organizations engaged in it as well. Um, and some of the academic, uh, some of the law programs, I think Georgetown had a group that went down there as well. So um, there are quite a number of people that are fired up on the issue. So um, I don't know uh, in terms of US government or others, but um, we've, we've certainly been engaged on it. Um, on the question of conditionality, that's actually really, to me, that's a really tricky one because if you're talking about humanitarian assistance, um, even as a human rights advocate, you know, um, I, I think you know, you, th there's ways to, to raise issues, but do, do you make the, the humanitarian assistance conditional on, um, on uh, respect for other human rights, basically? Um, when there's such a need for the humanitarian assistance. So I'm, I'm philosophically, I'm, I'm, I would struggle with that in some ways, but um, it's maybe just me. Uh, thanks, I'll, I'll just say a couple of quick things. One on the uh, issue of the, you know, these gaps of enforced migration. I mean, I don't 
I think it's true, you know, that that there's a limit to, you know, the legal categories under U.S. law. But I think the pressure has, uh, you know, created more space in, in, in novel ways, or if you really look carefully at what's happening in U.S. asylum law over the last few years, um, where there, especially the concept of uh, membership in a particular social group, um, you know, very difficult to define what that means. Uh, that's really an area where I think there has been a lot of cross-pollinization across different countries and how they've kind of defined that. And um, over the last few years, you know, we've had a pretty uh, a landmark case um, that uh, recognized domestic violence uh, in Guatemala as a basis for an asylum claim. Uh, it's, as lawyers, it would be, you know, it's worth reading that case because the analysis is very thin. It basically just said DHS is not going to oppose this, so okay, we'll go with it. I mean, it's, it's not like there's a, a lot of connecting of the dots, but it's just a, so, you know, you can see that as a, releasing that pressure valve to kind of broaden that scope of asylum to capture new categories. And I think especially in the Central American situation, the issues of gangs right now is very unsettled, very uh, difficult. Um, but, you know, it can lead to some very strange outcomes where, you know, right now you really can't get asylum just on the basis that you were targeted by a gang for recruitment. Um, but there was a case, I believe, that involved a mother who was targeted because her son resisted recruitment. And she was able to make an argument that, that it was, she was a member of a particular social group of her family that uh, you know, was then being persecuted on that basis and she got asylum. You know, strange result if you think about it, um, that the kid couldn't get asylum but the, but the mother could. So we'll see how this all shakes out. I think it's gonna be a very interesting area and, and I think in terms of US lawyers getting involved, you know, that, that it, um, is an important area. Um, on, ha on Haiti, I will say that uh, certainly from the U.S. perspective, um, it, it, it was not something we ignored. We were extremely uh, involved uh, in that whole situation of um, the decision in the Dominican Republic that stripped uh, nationality um, uh, from all these Dominicans of Haitian descent. Uh, but it was, I think, a great example of what I've mentioned in my remarks about humanitarian diplomacy. Um, and, uh, but that involved a lot of behind the scenes diplomacy where there were some decisions about the best way to get action in that circumstance was not necessarily to stand on the lectern and criticize them in front of the world, but to work with them behind the scenes, let them know how um, unhappy we were. And, um, you know, I think that we didn't see like a mass uh, crisis. You know, we did, there definitely undoubtedly been uh, some individuals who have crossed the border into Haiti and that we're watching very carefully, uh, but we did not see some kind of mass deportation of Dominicans of, of Haitian descent, and I think that the U.S. and UNHCR did a lot of work to try to um, uh, achieve that outcome. Thank you, and we will, we will now switch to our last, back up here, uh, and to our last speaker of the formal program, and our formal program will will end. You heard the, the popping of the wine cork. Uh, so it is a very short presentation, but uh, for us on the committee, uh, it's a crucial part because Gina Del Chiaro is going to talk to us about particular ways that you and me and your friends, uh, law students and lawyers in New York can get involved and provide assistance to asylum seekers and refugees. Thank you. I see a lot of familiar faces in the room. I know several of you have done asylum work, but I'm here to speak on behalf of Human Rights First and also the many other legal services organizations in the city who provide assistance to refugees and other immigrants in need of protection. Um, for those of you who have not done asylum work, um, I urge you to get involved. We see cases from all over the world. So when you think about the photos and the headlines and the horrendous news that you've seen coming out of um, the Middle East, coming out of Europe with respect to Syrians, um, know that several years ago when things were heating up, these clients were coming into our office, the lucky few who made it to the United States, seeking attorneys for their cases. And that's the heart of what we do. We've been doing this work for over 30 years, thanks to the work of people like Eleanor Acer and several others. And we work very closely with pro bono lawyers. We've been doing it for a long time. 
and our program wouldn't work without the support and the help of pro bono assistance through lawyers like you. So thank you to those of you who have done this work before and to those of you who are considering it. Um, I can't really say enough about how rewarding and just absolutely inspirational this kind of work is. We're really lucky to be here in New York where some of the legal arguments that you just heard about with respect to um, women who are trapped in domestic relationships who can now uh, put forth a cognizable asylum claim based on one of the protected grounds or people who are fleeing gang violence in Central America, um, we have the ability to make those claims as we have been doing for years actually before Matter of ARCG came out, which is the case that you just heard about. Um, and we're blessed because many of the judges here in the New York and the New Jersey courts are very sophisticated, very kind and respectful judges who really understand good legal arguments. We know how to make those arguments. We will work with you to make those arguments and those will save lives, quite frankly. So I urge you to get involved. We're not the only game in town. Um, there are several other organizations and I'm just gonna name a few. If you're interested in doing this work and you wanna focus on a particular type of case or a particular region. For example, if you want to work with families, there are organizations that will just focus on families like Sanctuary for Families, for example. If you want to work with children, uh, you could work with Kids in Need of Defense or KIND or Safe Passage Project, which both are set up to work with you and, and help you along the way. Um, Human Rights First takes cases, every type of case, um, including detained cases. And I have with me tonight, for anyone who might be interested, and we'll talk in a minute, uh, we'll be over here to my left. Um, we have cases available right now, two from Somalia, one from Russia, one from Haiti, and one from Honduras. Um, so for anyone who's interested, please come talk to me afterward. And for those of you who are too busy and, and you just can't take on a case right now, um, if you have language skills, we can always use volunteer interpreters. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without people who speak languages from across the globe. So I urge you to get involved, and um, there's more information at this table to my left. And before I wrap up, we're gonna show a very short video, uh, which I know is preaching to the choir a bit, but take a look. <laughs> or not. Of course, it worked before all of you were sitting in your seats. All right, I think we're going to have to skip the video. Um, one other reminder, there many of you got, oh, well, that's not going to work. Many of you got um, or should have seen a volunteer form on your way in. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in any way, like I said, even if you know that you can't take an asylum case right now, or you can't take one of the other cases from the legal services organizations that I mentioned, um, please feel free to fill that out. Um, you can drop them off at the table here. Melissa is holding up a sample here to my left, or to your right. Um, and one other reminder is that for those of you who want CLE, be sure to drop your CLE forms off at the table where you checked in on your way in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gina, for all the work you do and for your efforts. I encourage everybody to get involved, either now or soon. Uh, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our speakers for tonight and then join us for some refreshments. <laughs>